somebody asked me upstairs um, as I was coming, coming into the room which part of Ukraine I'm from. Um, it's Australia. <laughs> <laughs> to answer the question, uh, is Russia uh, a new imperialist power? Um, my answer is the negative. It's not, no. It's a very old imperialist power. <laughs> it's, a, it's a power that has been growing since 1482. Um, and with six expansions, exceeded 20 million square kilometers by the First World War. Uh, it was the weakest of the European imperial powers on the eve of the First World War. Uh, and it was also an imperialized power uh, by big uh, financial interests of the West European states. And that is why it collapsed um, under the pressure of the First World War. But it was an imperialist power already, um, conquering a periphery um, that extended right up to the territories conquered by the other European powers, um, all the way to China, to the Pacific, to the Baltic, to the Black Sea, and to the Carpathian Mountains. Now, I suppose. The question arises in everybody's head, well, what about the Soviet period? Did, it, did this end um, Russian um, imperialism as a structure, as a state and military and economic structure of domination and oppression of nations by the Russian nation? That's what I mean when I talk about imperialism. Well, in terms of um, economic relations, uh, it's a very mixed picture because we do see uh, the emergence of the non-Russian peoples um, from largely peasant, uh, rural, illiterate um, existence um, to um, fully mature social structures and the acquisition of the capacity to rule themselves quite independently by the time the Soviet Union ended. But this was a very uneven process but what is more important is in the Soviet period, in the Stalin period, let me be precise, uh, the Soviet state used extra economic means, state bureaucratic, bureaucratic means, to oppress and to deny the right of national self-determination to the non-Russian peoples through repression, through the extermination of national Bolshevik and communist leaders of the non-Russian peoples, through famine, through migration, through the resettlement of Russians to the non-Russian republics. And if you study the economics of the period, um, the result in terms of socio-economic development was the uneven development of the nations, of the, their social structures, um, of their opportunities in life. If you look at their languages, uh, the same thing happened. And so one cannot say that Russian imperialism, and yes, of course, great Russian chauvinism, as an ideology of Russian imperialism, um, you cannot say that it disappeared in the Soviet period. And after the 10-year hiatus that, under Yeltsin, that um, Catherine um, spoke about in the previous presentation, we see the restoration of a capitalist imperialism for the second time of a Russian capitalist imperialism in the roughly 15 years of the rule of um, Vladimir Putin. For the Russian establishment, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, as Putin has said, was the greatest single tragedy um, of the 20th century. This was not a tragedy of the collapse of the Soviet state in the way that we understand it for them for, and for him. It was the collapse and the loss of a periphery that the Russian ruling nation had acquired over a period of over 500 years. That was a big tragedy for them. And that is what um, <coughs> part of the current project of the Russian state is all about, to reclaim that periphery. Under Putin, um, there has been quite an explicit strategy uh, for the restoration um, of 
Russian imperial rule. First, um, from around 1997-98, uh, to reclaim the near abroad, the immediate periphery um, around Russia through a state-led strategy of um, promoting several national economic champions in the fuel, energy, and mineral sectors to take back uh, the markets uh, and the processing and transiting assets um, of the former Soviet republics around Russia, namely Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, Armenia, and Kazakhstan. And in the second period, to use that reclaimed territory on the immediate periphery to pave the way for Russian transnational corporations such as Gazprom, Sistema, uh, Norelsk Nickel and others to pave the way for their entry uh, into wider markets, um, wider consumption markets, uh, investment areas and technologies beyond this immediate uh, territory so they can achieve transnational competitive status. The paradox um, of this process is that the Russian economy uh, has been very weakly driven by domestic demand as it has grown. Um, and it does not satisfy uh, its domestic demand. It is not a diversified economy as a result of this growth, nor is its bourgeoisie interested in diversifying that economy. Property ownership is too insecure in Russia, and uh, markets and strategic resources are in the gift of state authorities. So it has been more profitable um, for the oligarchs who have accumulated um, wealth from the exploitation of um, raw materials and energy resources to invest those proceeds beyond um, the Russian Federation. And they have invested them beyond the Russian Federation um, in economies that are more diversified, more technologically superior to the Russian one, and which afford them um, <coughs> security um, of the ownership of their property and their investments. So the paradox is that while the Russian national economy is not diversified, Russian capitalism is diversified, and is diversified sectorally and geographically along transnational lines of production, consumption, and investment. What are the destinations um, of that investment? Uh, Deutsche Bank report in 2006 showed that by that year, Russia was the <coughs> largest of all the BRIC, was the largest um, overseas um, or investor of capital overseas outside of its own borders of any of the BRIC countries. And in 2006, it was investing 160 billion US dollars. It was the second largest uh, investor in the so-called emerging market economies in the world after China, uh, after Hong Kong. Let me be specific. And if you look at the structure of overseas investment by Russian capitalists uh, around 2008 to 2010, 52 percent was invested in Western Europe. Around 20 percent was invested in the near abroad countries, that is to say immediately around uh, the Russian Federation, and about 10 percent in East Central Europe. How much time do I have, please? Another um, seven, eight minutes, if I'm not. Okay, let me just get a drink of water, please.